Thanks, you all. Um, as Enid said, my name is Guido, and it's a great honor for me to be here seeing some old friends and hopefully making some new ones, and mostly standing here in front of a group of people who really understand, I think, what the foundation of health is and how it's connected to soil and how it's connected to these living beings that we share this planet and this ecology with, which are plants, and how important and foundational those are in, in maintaining our quality of life and making us happy and making us vibrant. I had the privilege of living on a great piece of land in central Vermont for about 13 years with my wife, um, right outside of Montpelier, which is where we grew a lot of medicinal plants. A few vegetables too, but you know, I'm a very lazy gardener, as you will see from some of the pictures of my garden, which are basically weed patches, and that's why I like medicinal plants. Many of them are perennial and they kind of do their own thing, and I, I really just encourage and support them a little bit, which will be a recurrent theme in, in what I want to talk about today. But I really want to bring you the perspective of the herbalist, um, more than the soil scientist or the gardener. And nowadays, I work more clinically, um, focused on research and focused on working one-on-one -on -one with clients to bring medicinal plants and, and whole foods into their life in a good and positive way to improve their health and the outcomes when they're working in the context of conventional medicine or technological medicine. That doesn't mean that I don't get a chance to, you know, almost every day get outside and spend time in the woods and fields of Vermont. We live in an amazing place and that's really important to me, especially now that I have a daughter um, whom I really think helps me get out there every day and visit the wild places of Vermont and get our hands dirty in the summer. And that's just really crucial and really important, not something I have to tell you. But I'd like to spend about 40 minutes or so um, talking today uh, about the herbalist's perspective. Um, sharing a little bit about what it means to use medicinal plants, um, how that information might be connected to the health of the soil and the health of the gardens then the farms that we work in, and how we can leverage that in our gardens, in our farms, and in our kitchens to really help achieve vibrancy and health in the human being, in the human ecosystem. And I'd like to frame the whole thing um, with this idea that I think is a really important idea and one that herbalists grew up on and, and keep at the forefront of their work every day, which is that the ecology is a living being, that the garden is a living being as much as the human being is alive, that we share sort of these nested cycles of life with the ecology around us, with the environment around us. And I think this is obvious and clear living in a place like Vermont, right? And sitting in a place, in this incredible structure here, you know, sort of at the edge of Lake Champlain in the Champlain Basin, with the Adirondacks on one side and, and the spine of the Green Mountains on the other and, and Camel's Hump looking out over us, you know, when I hike that mountain in the summer, which I try to do as often as I possibly can, and, and you can see the basin out to the west in front of you, you really get this sense that this multi-million year old living being is sort of holding us, right? And is holding our farms and is holding our gardens and is holding us and, and we're kind of like cells or gut flora for the Champlain Valley working around and living here. Our lifespans are really short. This valley is old and very wise, but it holds us. And you see these nested cycles of life everywhere. So I wanna come back to that theme over and over again because I think if we keep that awareness um, in our heads and in our hearts, then that's how we end up with sort of resilient food systems, resilient gardens, resilient farms, and resilient human beings. And that's ultimately what I think health is, right? Resiliency, joyfulness, adaptability. This sort of living being, macrocycle, microcycle thing, it exists at all levels. So it's not just, you know, the, the planet or the hemisphere or the bioregion. It's also our gardens and our fields. And you know, this is a little bit of what my herb farm used to look like. Um, you can see a bunch of different plants. You know, we've got some bee balms and goldenrod that's yet to bloom and echinacea and some rudbeckia and some flea banes. And there's bed straw and cleavers in there. It's just kind of a tangled mess of weeds, really. But all of them have important value to me as an herbalist. And they all work with each other as components of a living ecology. And I really thought, and I still think, that my field was alive. It had its own consciousness. It did its own thing. It had its inputs and its outputs and its behavior. And I was kind of a participant in all of that, rather than a sort of 
controller and agriculturalist that dictated what was going on in that field. In fact, often I think it was the other way around. My behavior was influenced by the plants that I had the privilege of working with. And I don't know if you all have ever noticed that in the work that you do, but to a certain extent, I really feel like we're all working for the plants and our behavior is driven by them. In any living being and in any living ecology, if you want it to be healthy, what I've tended to see is that the most connection and interrelationship that you see in that living being and in that ecology, the greater its degree of health. The level of diversity, the level of connection and interrelationship that you see really is directly proportional to the wellness and the vibrancy of that living system. And I think we see this in human beings, but we see this in the garden and in the farm too. Let me just give you a little example. Um, there's this, this metaphor for like engaging with a task or this expression that is used, which is getting your hands dirty, right? You can talk about a problem in the abstract and you can you know, theorize about potential solutions, but when it comes down to actually doing work, that's when you get your hands dirty. You dive in there in the soil, you start working with the soil, and you start achieving change. So getting our hands dirty, this is something as gardeners that we all know and we understand, right? And if you're anything like me, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, when you're out in the garden, working with the soil, working with plants, getting your hands dirty, your spirit shifts. If you're like me, you calm down a little bit. You slow down a little bit. And this is why it's important for me to do that as often as I possibly can with my daughter and with my wife during the week because otherwise I'm up here in my brain kind of like going nuts, doing research, and the physical experience of getting my hands dirty is really, really important. And this may be, you know, we might understand this in some kind of intuitive way like, well, yeah, sure, you're outside in nature, there's birds, there's sun, it just feels nice. Of course you're going to feel better. As my friend Paul Betts of High Ledge Farm used to say, you know, this is the best office view ever as we were sitting out in his farm field looking out at um, Nelson Pond up there in Calais. And it's true. But what researchers are starting to find is that when we interface with the soil in a living way by putting our hands into it, weird things start to happen, transfers start to occur between the soil and between us. So this has all been sort of researched for many years and, and reviewed and summarized um, at this point. It's pretty clear that gardening has important profound effects on the human psyche. So they're starting to use gardening therapy for anxiety and depression. They're starting to bring it into assisted living situations to help people feel more engaged and more connected and basically more healthy to actually just work in the garden. But interestingly, and this was um, you know, research that Christopher Lowry over there in England did, discovered that it's not just the experience of gardening that's achieving these changes in the human psyche. There actually is a bacterial transfer that occurs when we get our hands into soil. And Laurie and his team isolated this bacterium called Mycobacterium vacae and found that this bacterium has profound effects on the serotonin system in the human nervous system. It gets onto our hands, it gets into our bodies in various different ways if we don't wash our hands, and it has effects on our neurotransmission. So the fact that we feel less anxious and less depressed isn't just this sort of nebulous, like, I like being outside thing. There is a physical transfer of bacteria that impact our internal ecology as much as they impact the external ecology. And to me, this is really profound stuff. Again, if you think of the garden as a living being and us as participants in it, it's giving us signals in physical, tangible forms in the form of this bacteria and many other signals, too that affect our mood, that drive our behavior, that make us feel more well, less anxious, less depressed, more alive. And so now, if you take a couple of different examples of different gardens, right, and up here we have uh, corn harvest in Iowa, and down below we have an aerial shot of Kate Farm, which is a farm, an organic farm here in Vermont, in central Vermont, that I actually got to spend some time on, and back when I was selling medicinal plants and, and extracts at Farmer's Market in Montpelier, um, work with and interact with um, Richard Wiswall of Cape Farm and Sally. Good folks, good farmers. So there's an obviously really big difference between these two farms. And let me just ask you, or maybe I don't have to ask you, what about the bacterial content of the soils in these two different farms? Any guesses? Right. I mean, we don't have to guess. We know already 
Conventional agricultural methods have a profoundly different bacteriological content in the soils of those two different ways of growing plants. In the cornfield in Iowa, we have not only different species, but a dramatically lower content of bacteria. On the organic farm, we have greater abundance and diversity of species, but also the ones that seem to be able to interface and interact with human beings, like Mycobacterium vaccae. So if we want to get happier and less anxious working with soil, it makes a whole heck of a lot more sense to work with an organic soil that is actually alive and rich with bacteria than it does by trying to stick our hands into the soil of a cornfield in Iowa. And in fact, I don't think humans stick their hands into the cornfield in Iowa very much. They tend to interface with it with machinery. And I don't think this is a coincidence, right? I really don't think it's a coincidence. And we'll explore this a little further. So this is just a little bit of an example of how the way we work with our soil, the way we work with how we handle our soil and interface with it can have profound implications for our health right away, simply through something as, as simple as transferring bacteria into our gastrointestinal systems and then into our nervous systems and into our spirit. But I'm not a soil scientist, I'm an herbalist. And herbalists do all sorts of crazy things, like we harvest oats when they're ridiculously underripe in order to dry them and give them to people as tea, because what we believe is that that underripe oat, when it's harvested at the milky stage, is a profound nourisher and tonifier for the nervous system. So if we're trying to help someone who has you know, anxiety or depression, whose nervous system is out of balance, we'll give them this tea of oats that are harvested in an underripe state, not necessarily to push their neurotransmitters one way or another, but really just to provide support and nourishment. And again, this is a recurrent theme that you see in herbal medicine. Herbal medicine is not about pushing back against disease. Technological medicine does that really well. Herbal medicine is much more about setting the right operating context for the human being. Nurturing, supporting, and providing plants that really encourage a balanced and optimal state. This isn't because we think disease comes from an imbalanced internal state. Sometimes it does, but in many other cases it doesn't, you know? Sometimes you get a drought, regardless of how good, you know, the quality of your soil is on your farm. Sometimes a kid gets a fever, regardless of how well they nourish themselves and how much they play. Disease can sometimes just happen in mysterious, random, and cruel ways. But what we've seen as herbalists is that if you do that nurturing, if you do that building and strengthening of the internal environment of the human being, humans handle disease a whole heck of a lot better. At the very least, their quality of life improves. And in many cases, healing happens and recovery happens. We see this especially in the chronic disease processes that modern technological medicine has such a hard time with. Cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes and obesity, the metabolic syndrome, this dysregulation of blood sugar that we see. These are the top three killers in the United States today, and technological medicine is having a heck of a time dealing with them. Herbal medicine can help set the stage for improvement and recovery in these three critical areas of cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes in ways that are very different from the way technological medicine approaches the problem. And just as an example, you know, in the context of cancer, we're starting to see a lot of research build up at this point that herbal medicine is very good for improving outcomes for folks who are experiencing a range of different types of cancer. Now we're seeing meta-reviews where all this research is getting collated, and in China, where they give herbs like astragalus, donkwai, and romania to folks who are experiencing cancer, the outcomes, the quality of life are much better. Folks are seeing this in Europe as well. In fact, folks are seeing this throughout the world. When you incorporate medicinal plants in the context of modern conventional treatment, people just do better. Ten years ago, I would always harp on this point, and I would say, why is this not happening in the United States? Why do they give medicinal mushrooms to folks who have cancer in China and in Japan, but not in the United States? I can't say that quite as much anymore, because hospitals in the US are actually starting to do this now because it's becoming pretty clear that medicinal plants are really helpful. No, they're not a cure for cancer, but when they're added into conventional treatment, the outcomes are consistently way better than without them. So we're seeing it at the Cleveland Clinic, major treatment hospital in the United States, but we're seeing it here at the University of Vermont Medical Center too, where the program in integrative health is spearheading the incorporation of medicinal herbs, herbal medicine, and other complementary modalities into research, into education and into clinical practice. 
And this to me is really, really encouraging and being able to follow that and partner with that um, is really one of the great joys of my life right now, especially since I started practicing herbal medicine in the late 90s and early part of the 21st century. And, and it was a struggle back then um, to incorporate this into the lives of patients who were dealing with conventional treatment. But herbal medicine is a little bit messy. We don't use the same sort of dosage standards that technological medicine uses. We tend to put everything into big pots and tell people to boil it. And we're like, yeah, if you drink a cup today and 12 ounces tomorrow, it's OK. Our brews and our remedies are, are definitely fuzzier and somewhat more complicated and really messy and disorganized when you compare them to little pills in prescription bottles. But in my opinion, that's a good thing. It really is OK, because largely medicinal plants are very, very mild agents, especially the way we use them for support. They don't tend to push the physiology too strongly in one direction or another. And they're cocktails of many, many different plants. And again, because they're not pushing back against disease, but they're really sort of enhanced foods, we use them in soups, we use them in broths, and we do that in a very, very safe, although, you know, like I was saying, somewhat messy and disorganized way. But if you really think about it, the way herbalists approach healing, it's a lot like gardening. Instead of dealing with a farm or with a field, we're dealing with the human being as an ecology and a living being. But if you remember that this life, this consciousness, this essence exists at many different levels of reality, from the Champlain Basin to our farm, to our garden, to our backyard, to our kitchen, to our family unit, to our bodies, then you can see that the approach that organic farmers would use for their field with nurturing the soil, with making sure that the field kind of has the best possible inputs, is very similar to the approach that herbalists use when nurturing the internal human environment. And it relies on some key kind of universal principles. Increasing biodiversity, the more diverse, the more sort of roiling and complicated and messy and interconnected, the better the outcome usually. Focuses on respecting the system rather than trying to think for the system. Rather than pushing the system in one direction or another, we say let's respect and trust the way the system works, provide the right operating conditions, and let the system sort itself out. And focusing on supporting and nurturing rather than controlling or channeling or dictating behavior. I mean, this is something that was really driven home to me as a parent, right? Creating the right operating environment for my daughter tends to lead to much better outcomes than trying to control my daughter's behavior directly. I've also seen this in immunology. Creating the right operating environment for the human immune system using medicinal plants like astragalus or medicinal mushrooms like reishi tends to lead to much better outcomes for allergies, autoimmune disease, hypersensitivity, and cancer than to use things like steroids or antibiotics, where we're trying to control and affect the system directly. It may work in the short term to do that, but in the long term, it actually makes the system less resilient. And I really believe that this is the same thing we see in organic agriculture, right? It's the same thing we see by nurturing the soil, creating the right operating environment for our farms and for our gardens, rather than attempting to control the inputs and dictate the circumstances and dictate the behavior of the field, working with our plants rather than attempting to make them work for us. So if we can kind of agree that this is the system and this is the context that we're using, what are the specifics, especially when we're talking about herbal medicine, especially when we're talking about how soil and plants can affect human health? Well, the specifics, at least in my toolkit, are these medicinal plants. And if you look at them, there's some that are, I would say, special, you know, that are more like garden plants, like calendula or lily of the valley. But the rest of them are largely weeds. They like being around us to a certain extent. You know, I've always found a nettle patch prefers being next to the compost than out in the middle of nowhere. But yarrow and dandelion, burdock and nettles, Cleavers and bedstraw, these are all weeds. And they're some of our most important medicinal plants. So these are the specifics that I use to help nurture the soil. They're the compost for the human being that I really think helps set that optimal operating environment for the human being to thrive and be more resilient. What makes them special? What makes them different? 
I think to really understand that, we've got to take a little digression into the history of nutrition, at least the way humans understand it. Or maybe we should better call it nutritionism, which is a term that Michael Pollan uses to talk about nutrition science, because it really is more of an ideology than a true science, nutritionism. So let's take a little digression here. The first thing that we sort of realize from a nutrition perspective is that there's the macronutrients that living beings need. You know, we need our proteins, they make our structure, they make our enzymes, they help kind of create the mold and the shape and the phenotype of what we are. We need our lipids, they make the cell membrane around all of our cells, but they're also an important energy source, source of hormones eventually. And we need our carbohydrates as an energy source. Boom, macronutrients, here we go, this is the stuff we need as living beings. Now, it became pretty clear pretty quickly that this wasn't quite enough, though. You know, starting with Lind in the middle of the 1700s, you know, he was noticing that people who really only focused on macronutrients, potatoes and grease, like lard, and jerky, and took them in an isolated environment out on a ship, developed these weird things like scurvy. And so Lind was like, hey, what happens if we give these folks limes? And they start drinking and eating limes as part of their diet on the ship, and lo and behold, scurvy disappeared. It was actually the first controlled clinical trial um, that was ever conducted by human beings. And it led eventually to the discovery of all these things that we call vitamins, right? Like our fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, and our water-soluble vitamins like vitamin B and vitamin C. And to that were added the, the minerals, you know, our electrolytes like sodium and potassium, our important minerals like calcium and magnesium, all of the trace minerals. And now, you know, nutritionism says, wow, we've really got it figured out, guys. If we've got all these vitamins and all of our macronutrients and all of our minerals, then we've got everything the human being needs to be alive and to be healthy. And this may be true for a couple of years, right? You certainly will notice a vitamin deficiency pretty quickly. So those were the things that we kind of zeroed in on immediately, right away and we started adding into the human mix along with the micronutrients. And you know, we, we've added a few little nutrients here and there, and, and now we basically think that we have it all figured out and we can create stuff like this. <laughs> Boom, it's food, we're golden, right? It's got all of our macronutrients in it, it's got our proteins, our carbs, and our fats, it's got all our 24 vitamins and minerals, right? It's a meal replacement. You take it every day. You're going to be happy like she is. And best of all, it's natural. <laughs> Guys, this is essentially what conventional technological agriculture is, except it's done on the human body. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, some trace nutrients here and there to cover the basic nutritional needs, right? of a field or of a plant that's grown in that field. It's not a coincidence that we live in a culture that allows us to have technological agriculture that uses petrochemicals as a source of nutrition and also creates stuff like this and says that it's a meal replacement. This makes me depressed for a couple of reasons. Not only is cooking a meal super fun, and this is like, mix it with water and you're good to go. Not quite as fun. But it's also becoming pretty clear, and we see this with formula versus breast milk, right? It's becoming pretty clear that this is not a meal replacement. It might get you through a couple of years, but you're not going to be healthy if this is all you eat. And nutritionism can't really explain why that is. It's simple for those of us who understand organic agriculture, right? This is much less connected. The inputs that go into here are simple. They are isolated. They don't involve any getting your hands dirty. And the level of connection to the environment around us is nil when we consume something like this as a meal replacement. But the road goes both ways, you guys. And this is what the scariest part is for me. If we live in a culture where people feel like they can consume meal replacements and be happy and healthy, it will be an easy transition for them to say that soil can consume 
a meal replacement and be happy and healthy. And the plants that grow out of that soil can create health and happiness. Now, where do you think the protein, carbohydrates, and lipids that come into the meal replacement are coming from? They're coming from corn, wheat, and soy, which has covered and altered our ecosystem in the United States and in many other parts of the world in dramatic and profound ways. Because we monoculture all this stuff in order to create meal replacements, what do we need to do? We need to spray pesticides and herbicides on these monoculture fields that are huge, because otherwise they're not sustainable. And this has worked semi-well for us for what? 60, 70 years? It's a drop in the bucket, in the arc, not only of human history, but of planetary history. And for us to think that this is a sustainable practice is ridiculous. And we're starting to see that topsoils are suffering, that our water is getting polluted. And I would posit that cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes are linked to stuff like this. So the way we treat our internal ecology and the attitudes we bring to nourishing ourselves are reflected in the way we treat our external ecology. Because we are inextricably connected. We are part of macrocycle within microcycle, linked and nested, big ecology, little ecology, all one thing. Okay, whew, let's get that off of there. <laughs> so if we're talking about bringing diversity into human lives to encourage wellness and health. How do plants do this? If we're talking about improving and increasing connection, how does this like disorganized herb garden do this? We're starting to see that nutrition is more than macronutrients, vitamins, and minerals. Now people are starting to talk about phytonutrients in general. Has anyone heard this term? Phytonutrients and phytonutrient density. There's all these molecules inside plants that we just barely are scratching the surface of. And these molecules do really pretty incredible things. And they're not part of meal replacement shakes. One that I'm really fond of is the whole class of botanical chemicals called bioflavonoids. They're found in blueberries. They're found in goldenrod in abundance. They're found throughout the botanical kingdom. And yes, there's some plants that have more than others. But if you consume wild plants, you're going to get bioflavonoids. There's no way out of it. Bioflavonoids have incredible effects on the cardiovascular system. Not only do they alter the behavior of the heart, strengthening it, calming its contractions, affecting things like high blood pressure, but they also affect the inner lining of our blood vessels, improving the fluffiness and thickness of this protective layer called the endothelial surface layer that lines every single inch of the cardiovascular system in our bodies. This helps prevent atherosclerosis, or hardening of the arteries, which is the source of a huge amount of cardiovascular disease in this country. My contention is that one of the reasons we experience more cardiovascular disease in the Western world is because we have a deficiency of bioflavonoids in our life. Because the food that we eat has been stripped of these essential phytonutrients. Iridoids, really ridiculously bitter tasting chemicals, found in dandelion and blue vervain and gentian. This stuff tastes bad, you guys. If you've ever chomped down on like overripe dandelion leaves and gotten a good dose of iridoids, you know what that feels like. But iridoids have a dramatic effect on how we consume food. They decrease overconsumption while improving the secretion of digestive juices. They balance blood sugar levels and decrease insulin resistance. One of the reasons we may be experiencing more diabetes, difficulty controlling our appetite, certainly is the ubiquitous presence of sugar, but it may also be a deficiency of some of these bitter phytonutrients that we have systematically stripped from the food that we eat and the food that we consume. Not only by breeding it into varieties that are more cosmetically sound, easier to ship and store, custom tailored for the industrialized agriculture system, but not custom tailored for human health. But then we take those grains and we mill them and take the last vestige of bitterness out, removing all the fiber, removing everything that is potentially challenging to the human being. As a result, the human system, the digestive system, the liver, our hormones that are connected to our sensitivity to insulin, suffer. So this is pretty clear, you know, bioflavonoids affect cardiovascular disease, they affect cancer, preventing cancer, 
Iridoids affect blood sugar balance and improve digestive function, and we've taken them out of the context of our lives in pretty dramatic ways. But I would like to introduce you to a third class of molecules just to let you know that, like, we didn't even know this stuff existed 15 years ago. These are little snippets of RNA, a nucleic acid chain, that are about 20 to 25 codons long, okay? What that means is that they have about 20 to 25 different letters in them that can interface with our own genetic expression machinery. How DNA gets turned into RNA, gets turned into proteins, makes us who we are at a very basic level. 15 years ago, we didn't even know these existed. It was only six or seven years ago that we discovered that plants make these suckers, package them into little fat bubbles, we eat them, they get into our bloodstream, and they affect our genetic expression. Not only through substances like flavonoids and iridoids, but through genetic instructions, plants are sending these tendrils out to us saying like, listen guys, listen. If you want to be healthy, listen. It's as if the ecology is using these plants to create substances that are hormone-like to connect us back to itself. The Champlain Basin is creating organic farms to create phytonutrient-rich produce so that human beings can return to being part of the ecology and not be abstracted from it anymore. And that abstraction has led us to profound levels of disconnect, had led us to profound levels of chronic illness and chronic disease. And the solution may be as simple as organic agriculture and phytonutrient diversity. So if we recognize that these plants are doing this, that they're calling out to us, that they're acting as organs in the ecology, trying to knit us back into it with these green tendrils, with these chemicals. I would ask you, do you think organic cultivation increases the amount of phytonutrient density or decreases it compared to conventional agriculture? Organic agriculture seems to increase the level of phytonutrient density. The research on this topic is just starting, so I wouldn't call it conclusive yet. Part of the problem is that they're really only researching vitamins. They haven't moved out into the broader realm of isoflavones, bioflavonoids, iridoids, and microRNA. But as they're starting to do that, they're finding that these secondary plant metabolites are much higher in produce that is grown in organic farms. But they're also only really researching modern hybridized vegetables. They're not researching heirloom crops. And it's become pretty clear at this point, and this is a good book if you've not seen it, by Joe Robinson called Eating on the Wild Side, where she kind of catalogs and researches all the heirloom varietals of produce as alternatives to the modern varietals of produce that really, you know, it's crazy that we live in a food system where the food that we eat is custom tailored to industrial production and distribution, not custom tailored to human health. It's stripped of flavor and it's stripped of phytonutrient density because the phytonutrients taste bitter and they generally tend to lead to produce that isn't quite as shelf stable. So this is actually pretty important because if we lose control and we lose access to our heirloom seed varieties, things that organic farmers have been the stewards of for thousands of years, then we lose access to this dense pool of phytonutrients that are really, we're finding, vital to human health, especially when we're dealing with chronic disease. So again, not the modern, conventional, highly hybridized varieties of plants, but the heirloom varieties that rely on local food systems, short distribution chains, local farming, organic gardening and growth. Again, if you compare the two different fields that we looked at before, and you look at the level of phytonutrient complexity and biodiversity coming out of those two different farms, you basically have carbohydrates and fats coming out of that farm with very little else. Whereas coming out of the organic farm in central Vermont, you've got microbes, you've got flavonoids, you've got a range of bitter iridoids, you've got all sorts of diverse vegetables, and they're getting delivered and transported to local co-ops, local farmers markets that are within a 50 to 100 mile radius. The bioregion is talking. It's talking through organic farms. And if we listen as human beings, through this signal that is delivered on chemicals, phytochemicals, phytonutrients, and on microbes, 
don't wash your carrots. Then we will achieve better resilience and better health. The research around this is compelling, and I see it every single day. So I'd like to say that it's not just heirloom varieties of plants. It's not just a diversity of vegetables. But I really think, and I'd like to put in a plug for weeds. I know this might be a tough crowd to a certain extent for that purpose. And, and yes, weeds can be difficult. But to a certain extent, there are ways to incorporate buffer zones of weeds, which really are medicinal plants, in your gardens and in your farms. And if you do this, not only are you providing a reservoir of these important unhybridized medicinal species, which are by far the most rich in phytonutrients and phytochemicals, you also may improve pollinator diversity, really important in the context of what's happening to bees nowadays, monoculture versus diversified farms with weed buffer zones. You also are potentially improving the resilience of your farm and garden by adding in sinks for potential pests that help divert pests from your production crops. And you're having an effect on the soil as well. Some of the most interesting research that I've seen around medicinal plants, and again, I'm t I tend to focus in the other direction, right? What happens when humans eat them? But when medicinal plants are growing in a field, they secrete substances from their rhizosphere that send important signals to other plants. Companion planting, weed buffer zones with medicinal plants can have dramatic effects, potentially on increasing crop yields, and some of that research is starting to emerge. <clears throat> So, really just to conclude a little bit, and going back to that super diverse garden, weedy, disorganized, messy, if we want to achieve health, the way to do it is not through controlling inputs. Controlling inputs leads to sterile soil. If we do this for another 50 years, we will not have soil anymore. Sterile soil and the produce that is grown in it leads to food that has no soul anymore, to food that is disconnected and that cannot nourish human beings. And it is no wonder that human beings end up with chronic disease that is difficult to control. Similarly, if we use medicines that are only produced from petrochemicals or in laboratories, not to say that there's anything wrong with that in an emergency situation, and technological medicine is fantastic at putting, pushing back against disease. But if that's all that our medicine system has, then our medicine has no roots. It has no connection. It is disconnected from the ecology. And if we keep going down that path, we'll see what happens in any system that isolates itself, in any system that closes its, itself off. It dies. Human culture cannot withstand this. Our food system cannot withstand this. If we pursue this path, we will see what has already begun to happen. We can spill gallons of oil, millions of gallons of oil, into the Gulf of Mexico and not think twice about it. It's like, oops, that's crazy. We can create agricultural systems that put so much nitrogen and phosphorus into our basin that the Champlain Valley routinely experiences bloom of toxic algae. And we'll say like, oops, cost of doing business. Why do we say this? Because we eat meal replacement shakes. We eat food that is disconnected. We eat food that lacks diversity. And so again, increasing our biodiversity in our gardens and in our farms, not only will help the resilience of our soil, of our gardens and our farms, but it will also create this reservoir of food and medicine for people to improve their health and resilience. The consciousnesses are tied. They are not separate in any way. We are bound to plants. We are bound to our ecology. And we need to stand up and take responsibility for that fact, or we're just going to go down this road that leaves us disconnected, allows us to poison our water, allows us to poison our oceans. But standing here in front of you, I have great hope, because I know that that is not going to happen. 
I know that we are going to create decentralized food systems that rely on strong, nourished, dirty, crazy soil that is a riot of microbe and mycelium. We're going to create medicine systems that rely on wild plants as much as they do on the best of modern technology. And in so doing, what we're going to see is an increase in biodiversity, a system that nourishes and respects the inputs that are put into our context of the human being and into the context of our garden and farm. And as a result, our culture will start to shift. Our minds will start to shift. Our connection to the ecology will start to shift. Organic agriculture is the root and the foundation of this. It really is where health begins. Herbal medicine can help by taking some of those weeds and, and helping us figure out how to use them effectively. But it really relies on diversified, decentralized food systems and organic agriculture. If we can do this, then the next century is going to be an amazing century of health, resilience, and wellness, not just for us, but for our environment too. And I really think it starts here, and I want to honor you all for participating in that. Camel's Hump knows this. Camel's Hump sees this. It's reaching out to us. It's talking to us through our gardens. It's sitting right over there through this haze, right, of ice crystals in this incredible, crystal, beautiful, sunny morning here in February. So let's take up our wild weeds and walk, you guys. Thank you very much.